privilege and a great pleasure to be able to welcome um, all of you uh, here, to welcome you to the conference where we are modestly trying to advance ideas about how to rethink the politics of development so we can perhaps better understand uh, what's happening in this world in which we live, um, to welcome you to actually meeting with all the colleagues from the Effective States and uh, uh, Inclusive Development Research Centre, which we shortened to uh, ESID. It's a partnership that goes across uh, African, Asian, North American, Latin American, European universities, think tanks, uh, and uh, activist NGOs, uh, and you'll find there's a lot of people uh, here who've been part of our partnership, part of the network, which has been trying to advance the understanding of the politics of development. I'll also welcome you to the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester, which is where uh, the Effective States Research Centre has been, uh, has been uh, based uh, since 2010-2011 and also to Manchester and North West England. I was talking to a few people who hadn't got this far north uh, before from the, uh, the, the south, I think, and uh, also people who were visiting and that. And this is the warm heart um, of, uh, <laughs> of, 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 of the UK and of, of, of where things really happen. I come from Liverpool, so I have to be a bit cautious about praising Manchester. But this is, uh, this is where, yeah, certainly uh, the spirit is good. And then I have to say welcome to the UK to some of you who've had to struggle to get visas. And there are four or five people who haven't been able to get visas. But interestingly, processes of governance and British politics at the moment are very keen to make visas more difficult to get. And it's an interesting political moment in which we find ourselves. The conference is going to be sort of two and a half days of really stimulating action-packed activity. There are great plenaries plan, but I think also if you look at the parallels, you'll find that you'll have to make difficult choices about which parallel session to go to. We really struggled with the parallel sessions because there were so many of those which we knew everybody would want to listen to, but do look at those. Please make sure that, uh, that, that you, you take advantage um, of, uh, of those. Um, an event like this, and Professor sort of Jima mentioned it, as did Julia, get one thinking back. In late 2010, we were designing a proposal for an effective states uh, research centre, and in 2011, we launched it at Buxton, trying to pull together um, our ideas. At that stage, the world seemed to be coming out of shock, but that was the shock of a global financial crisis, which had almost closed down... Um, the capitalist world um, as we knew it, and I think at that stage we felt we were recovering from a great um, shock. Many of us, I think, still probably felt that we were in the third wave of democratization. We were still in that era. It had slowed down a lot. It wasn't the 1990s, but we probably still felt that we might have been in a, in a wave of uh, democratization. We knew that certainly thinking about the politics of development was very complicated and very messy and depended very much upon context and upon contingent um, factors. Um, but really we had very little indication of quite how things would unfold internationally and often nationally over the years that have uh, taken us to 2019. I was trying to think back and probably Danny Roderick's work on the trilemmas of globalization and the way in which that might uh, impact on national, uh, national development uh, w was probably indicating that and certainly was beginning to sort of point to the fact that populism might be uh, returning. But nine years later, eight, nine years later, we do find ourselves as we sort of begin to pull together threads of our research project in a, a very different world, a world uh, in which populism or neo-populism is rife, a world in which demagogues, demagogues in the USA, but I also think we're led by a demagogue in the UK, um, have great power and great standing and influence over political processes. Um, a world in which relationships have been defined, redefined in major ways, and the idea of the government and the loyal opposition, which one might have thought about in 2010, is now being recast, certainly in the UK, as the government and the enemy. And these people are the enemy. It's not that one is in the same game. One is at war with the people who do not agree with you. And this is quite a different context than we thought uh, back in 2010 uh, and 2011. Uh, we can all watch the news tonight, no doubt, to find out whether our Prime Minister has decided to say he will honour British laws or not. Um, but I was scratching my head last night when I heard that the Taliban had been invited to Camp David, I think on 9-11 itself, and that just seems something which I could not ever have imagined seven or eight years ago. And unfortunately, these 
factors do show us that uh, just how difficult it is to <laughs> anticipate or think that one is understanding the way in which political processes uh, are, are unfolding. In our case study countries, um, some things have gone well, some things have gone badly, but certainly for someone like me who works on Bangladesh, I've been alarmed at the way in which power has centralised in that country. I think in Zambia, where ESID had a workshop only a few weeks ago, we were very concerned about the way in which uh, power was concentrating there, and certainly in our case study countries, we've had some uh, cause for alarm. But perhaps there are pointers to hope in South Africa then, Perhaps a, a demagogue has, has moved on and someone who's not so much of a demagogue has come in in Sri Lanka and that. If any of you want to look at the really long durée, then I think we've mentioned it in the introduction, but do go to the People's History Museum here. Do look at Peterloo. But just over 200 years ago, uh, 17, 18 people were slaughtered just a few hundred yards uh, up the road here because they were peacefully protesting uh, against not having um, a vote. And certainly, although... Uh, you yeah, know, one may be concerned about what's been happening in British politics the last few years. Over the long durée, one could maybe, uh, yeah, feel that things have got um, much, uh, much better. Finishing off with, with a few thank yous. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you um, for, for coming, for being interested in the uh, topics that we're looking at, for bringing your work uh, to Manchester so that we can learn what you've been uh, working on and find out about your ideas and for listening to the sort of ideas uh, that, uh, uh, that we'd, we've had. Please do throw yourself uh, into all of the sessions. I've already mentioned the parallel sessions, but the, in some conferences, one skips parallel sessions. But if you skip parallel sessions in this, uh, not only will we record your names, but you'll also be, <laughs> you'll also be missing out on a, on a treat because those parallel sessions um, are so good. Towards the end and on the Wednesday afternoon, then there'll be an opportunity to think about what, what we've learned all of us, those of us in ESID, but all of you who've, who've joined us here to, um, to think about how we might better understand the politics of development, how that might lead us to thinking about forms of action, uh, about how to do development rather than what to do in development, and how to regret the political conditions that would allow social and economic progress for all of humanity rather than just uh, a component um, of, uh, of humanity. Um, uh, and finally, I'd like to certainly thank uh, all of the people who've helped to make the, the conference uh, possible. That's the whole partnership, but particularly Sam Hickey, uh, Pratish Bahuria, uh, Julia Brunt, Tim Kelsall, and Kunal Sen, who unfortunately can't be with us, but the sort of senior management team have really um, yeah, moved a mountain to get this all together. I do hope you endure it, and I do hope you find it productive. Professor Jima, back to the intellectual agenda. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. And um, if you didn't think you've contributed to the intellectual agenda by the very few words you've spoken, then I don't know uh, what else is an intellectual agenda. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, starting this journey and bringing it this far. Uh, I now go to Professor Grendel, uh, who I have just had the privilege of meeting in person the first time but whose work I have known and used and cited and benefited from since the early 80s. So um, there is yet another very big giant, Professor Emeritus at Harvard University, where she worked for three decades as an expert on the comparative politics of development. Uh, she is a pioneer in the field of politics and development and has published several landmark books um, and general articles, including the politics and, and po politics and policy implementation in the third world, which is one that I use copiously in my dissertation uh, scoping exercise. And then also, despite the odds, the contentious politics of education reform, and then in 2012, jobs for the boys patronage and the state in cooperative perspective. Her work has been an inspiration to ESSID, which has benefited from having her also as a much valued advisor in recent years. So Professor Grindel, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm, um, I'm very honored um, by your kind words. 
Um, and Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I've had the pleasure of accompanying much of the work of ESSET since 2011, and so I'm delighted to be here um, to be able to congratulate so many researchers and staff who have worked so hard on making politics so relevant to how we understand development. I'm also sorry that this is the last official gathering of the Klan. It's a very large one, and it's full of people with amazing insights and experiences and research and impact. And it has been a real honor to, um, to accompany um, this, uh, this Klan in its work. Um, I was assigned a very narrow topic, and that was to say a few words about taking politics seriously in understanding development. Um, it's an interesting question because I would think that just about any politician, any journalist, any pollster, any cab driver or barber will tell you that politics is important. So we have to wonder why we fuss so much um, about the importance of taking politics seriously in development and why do we invest so much time and so many resources uh, in demonstrating what is so obvious to so many already. Well, certainly it's because we're committed to deep, coherent, and theoretically engaging explanations of how, when, and why politics matters. We may develop distinct or more coherent explana explanations from those that are favored by journalists and cab drivers. Um, we certainly put time and energy into this enterprise because politics is complicated and opaque, as David was saying. It's about power, but power is notoriously slippery and difficult to, uh, to quantify. Um, or to even see being used. And it's also true that each situation offers its own battery of facts, actors, conditions, processes, systems, formal and informal institutions, and puzzles that we try and figure out. Regularity, rules, overarching patterns are difficult to find. It's difficult for us to, to agree on any theory, paradigm or framework that fits the multiple examples uh, and various levels of analysis that we work on from day-to-day decision-making and organizational action to broad historical trajectories of countries and regions. We do have considerable room to create and recreate explanations that we find more or less satisfying and worthy of debates. Lots of puzzles out there for lots of people to be engaged in trying to figure out. Just consider the enormous range of outcomes that we've viewed from the lenses of political analysis in the recent past. Economic growth and decay, state and institutional formation, the distribution of resources across populations and time, the management of natu natural resources, inequality and poverty, gender and development, conflict and stability, organizational and institutional performance, policy and organizational change initiatives, distinct paths to development, donor choices and behavior, the interaction of military, economic, and political elites, the design and implementation of social service provision, economic policy, energy, and other policy domains. The list could go on and on and on, and I think it's a very impressive list. It's indicative of the extent to which we do take politics very seriously in development, but we do so in a variety of ways with differing assumptions, frameworks, and units of analysis. Some approaches to exploring the role of politics and development have focused on very specific problems and interventions to 
uh, resolve them, while others have called attention to the tenacity of historically embedded institutions and structures that set limits on the possibilities for change. I suspect most of us have worked somewhere in between those two levels, um, focusing on comparative or country level studies of political interactions, state and party institutional contexts, groups and movements with political and policy goals, or a variety of conflicts and contentions over power. My own focus over many years has been on opportunities for policy and institutional change in contentious political environments. The ESSID work that we will be hearing much about has done, I think, an extraordinary amount of very, very interesting work in linking macro-level elite interactions with important policy and organizational initiatives at the more focused level. The ESSID Pockets of Effectiveness research raises some fascinating questions about political systems and how they operate. How do we explain positive organizational performance within contexts that are riddled with the potential for failure? The ESSID work, I think, also calls attention to distinctions between how politics work at national and international levels with the more specific political interactions involved in policy making and implementation change, um, uh, 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 explaining changes across policy domains. Overall, I think it's a good thing that po the politics and development work is broad and disparate, although we lack any strong or clear consensus about the impact of politics on development. I hope, and I expect we will continue to let a thousand flowers bloom in efforts to make sense of the extremely complex set of issues that we set before ourselves, whether we're working at macro or micro or meso levels of explanation. I do think we've made a lot of progress on insisting on the importance of politics if we are to understand development, and a lot of progress in taking political history seriously over the long durée and the more immediate past. I think we've also made a lot of progress in broadening the audience of those who are sensitive to the influence of politics and development. So rather than review how far we've come or where we necessarily have to go in the future, I'd like to just flag two issues in the field um, that all of us struggle with and um, in one way or another and ones that I think are worthy of raising for our attention. My purpose is not to suggest that we have to resolve these issues, but simply to lay out a couple of ways in which we differ among ourselves in how we assess possibilities for development through political lenses, to suggest some trends that we've seen in the field uh, about those differences, and to indicate the importance of becoming somewhat more self-conscious about how we address these differences. So two questions, two issues. The first question, um, how does change happen? Related, in this case, to the issue of structure versus agency. And secondly, the second question, is politics good or bad? Here, thinking about the normative impact of politics on possibilities for development. So first, focusing on structure versus agency and the issue of, or the question of how does change happen? We're dealing here really very much with the question of how much development potential is predetermined by structures put in place and maintained through historical conflicts and negotiations over power. That is, how much are we talking about winners and the structures they put in place to maintain their power over time, the bargains that they make about who has access to power and who doesn't, versus the capacity of individuals, groups, or organizations to challenge how, policy, how power is distributed, 
what decisions are made, and how institutions function. I've for a long time been interested in exploring the capacity of reformers to introduce significant changes in public policies and institutions, so I've struggled a lot with this issue. How much room for maneuver do reformers have to introduce significant changes in public policies um, um, vert and, and um, uh, versus the constraints set for them by structures of power? Clearly, this is not an either-or question, yet I think there, if we look back over where we've come from, I think there are some trends in responding to it, um, very general trends um, given the, the, the dis uh, disparate nature of our field. But I if you think back to the 1950s and the 1960s, as many countries gained their independence, agency was thought to be quite important, quite significant, and quite broad. It was a moment for creating new structures. Um, we focused a lot on issues of leadership and party building, uh, parties building new governments um, that would be more lasting and more equitable than those of the colonial past. We talked a lot at the community level about people coming together to solve important local problems. But by the mid-1970s through the 1980s, there was a significant change, I think, in, in the trends of how we thought about structure versus agency. In that period of time, many people focused on the structures of international debt and economic dependency as being paramount structures of authoritarianism, of neo-patrimonialism, of corruption and capture of state elites, and how those factors left little room for maneuver to introduce change. Developing countries were often thought to be caught, caught by the IMF, by their past policies, by their economic weaknesses, by their natural resource dependency, by their authority structures, by systemic corruption, that all of these factors making change almost impossible. In that same, later in that same period, um, through the 1980s and 1990s, we saw the emergence of the rational political actor model that gained increasing influence. This was a micro level focus on individuals, voters, politicians, public officials, individuals, but who were very constrained by assumptions about how decisions were made by individuals in political contexts. And so through that, we were able to explain the tragedy of the political commons, the failure of economies and states through the actions of numerous political and economic actors who were significantly constrained. In the 1990s and the 2000s, we saw a movement to bring the state back in. Um, we were, um, um, we found ourselves arguing for or against, I guess, um, the fact that institutions and states matter. They constrain the agency of economic actors, politicians, policymakers, voters, citizens, donors. Um, and we also um, spent time thinking much more about the importance of informal institutions that at times undermined the impact of formal ones. But once again, I think the emphasis was on um, structures um, uh, rather than agency. Currently, I think we're still grappling with this question. In the politics of development, how much room is there for agency in the creation or alteration of institutions, organizations, policies. How important are individuals, voters, parties, policymakers, disturbed or narcissistic leaders? Um, how durable and determinative are institutions, either formal or informal? 
in shaping individual and group behavior, the activities of state leaders. I think there is, as, as David was mentioning, added interest now in these questions, as in some already developed countries, countries we assume to have very strong, deeply rooted um, institutions and structures acting as constraints, we now fear that they may not be strong enough to constrain political leaders in undertaking dangerous or questionable policies and institutional changes. It's a very live issue for all of us and for our societies, I think, to be very conscious about this issue of how much room is there for making, helping change to happen. And these questions, I think, continue to be a challenge to the research on politics and development. A second issue, a second question, has to do with the implications of politics for development. If we accept that politics is central to explaining development or its absence, to what extent is politics good or bad for development? Once again, this is not an either or question. We can obviously respond by saying that politics can be good, bad, or neutral, or indifferent for development, good, bad, or neutral for people, groups, organizations, institutions. But I think, once again, there have been some trends in um, how we approach this question historically. In the 1950s, 1960s, I think politics was generally seen as a, po a, a positive thing people coming together to create their own democracies, decision-making processes at national and international levels. We spent time thinking about great leaders and the political movements and political parties that they uh, created and chartered. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, there really was kind of a sea change back to politics being seen as an extremely negative factor, explaining failed states, corrupt leaders, distorted policies, ineffective management, economic decline. Truly, politics was a spanner in the work in much of the, the research that was done during this period. And much of the response to seeing politics as negative was really an effort to really try and extract as much politics as possible um, from, uh, in terms of uh, privatization and deregulation and, and, and moving um, uh, away from politics that could be um, so destructive. The rational actor model, um, once again, um, individuals within constrained environments were often also seen as leading to negative outcomes. In the 1980s, and, and I'm sorry, the 1990s and the 2000s, perhaps we saw a movement towards more positive implication of politics with efforts to replace authoritarian governments with more democratic ones people coming together to build new institutions, new structures of leadership, political parties, but I think also a trend towards continuing to see politics as kind of the spanner in the work, in the works. Right now, I think as David mentioned before, we are in a period of very negative perspectives about politics. We are distressed over the failures of democratic politics, the new authoritarianism, the weakness of institutions in the West. We talk a lot about destructive and divisive politics and elections, about toxic leaders and political environments. Once again, I'm not suggesting in any way that we pick a side, but I think we can become more self-conscious as to what we are implying about the impact of politics on development. From my own normative perspective, um, I'm hoping that we're using politics to explain how things succeed as well as how they fail. So here are two challenges for using political lenses to understand development. How much agency is possible in development and what are the normative implications of our research about the practice of politics. No right or wrong 
positions, but important to think about. Um, and it occurs to me that as we listen to the papers that are being presented in the various sessions, it will be kind of interesting to assess where they fall out on those kinds of continua. So having said that, um, these are two issues that I've outlined that I think are questions faced by those who are already convinced that politics matters, people inside the tent. I assume we are all inside the tent. But I think we also face, uh, even sometimes from with our, in our own ranks, continued efforts to depoliticize development and even to depoliticize the politics of development to diminish its importance. These have to do with the language we choose to use um, in discussing development. It's only language, but language counts because it structures the way we think about how power and politics work. So I want to suggest two contemporary ways in which politics is denied through language. Both of these come from discussions of public policy and institutional change, and both are used very liberally in the field today. Now, forgive me if this sounds like a rant. Um, I think um, we all have things that make us crazy, and these are two things <laughs> that have that impact on me. Okay, so the first, in terms of language, is um, the use of the term stakeholders. <laughs> Many current discussions of institutional and policy reform initiatives in countries around the world refer to stakeholders. Stakeholders are those who are expected to be directly affected uh, one way or another by changed policies or institutions. Children and parents as well as teachers in education reform initiatives, for example, or citizens in efforts to change electoral laws. That's a good and valuable focus. We should think of who's going to be affected. But if we adopt the language of stakeholders, I think we need to be very careful to distinguish stakeholders from political actors. That's a term I use to signal, that, um, to signal those who have the greatest capacity to influence the content, timing, implementation, and sustainability of new politi policies or institutional arrangements. Not all stakeholders have this capacity. Children, parents, and even individual teachers may be affected by policy changes, but the actors in reform initiatives are much more likely to be teachers unions, ministry officials, and political leaders. In electoral reform, the actors are likely to be political parties, legislators, local and national political leaders, not citizens as a general category. Actors certainly usually are stakeholders, but not all stakeholders are political actors, and I think that distinction is important. Certainly there's always the possibility that some stakeholders can become organized or take to the streets to assert their voices in policy debates. That's certainly what's going on right now in Hong Kong, as hundreds of thousands of people um, who we certainly are stakeholders are um, indicating their capacity to be political actors. <laughs> NGOs and political parties or movements might sometimes represent or mobilize the voices of stakeholders. But I think the general failure to make the distinction between stakeholders and political ag actors ignores the distribution of power in a society and its institutions. Some are powerful and able to make their voices heard very effectively in discussions, debates, and decision making, while others are marginalized, mute, or repressed. It matters who's at the table when the decisions are being made, and even if you call them stakeholders, many of them are not at the table. One of the reasons that I find the political settlements work of Essence researchers so engaging that it's very explicit in focusing on elites and the ways in which they interact, the bargains they strike, 
how they determine who is relevant and who is not, who's in the room and who doesn't get to be there. Not because they're stuffy elitists, um, but because they recognize power differentials and how decisions are made um, that affect the possibilities for development. Politics is about power, who has access to it and who doesn't. And if we want to claim that politics matters, this means that we really shouldn't confuse those affected by change with those who have the capacity to make it happen or not. Um, my second, second part of my rant, political will. Some current discussions of development trivialize the nature of politics by referencing the political will of governments. When governments don't introduce recommended changes in policies, practices, institutions, they're excoriated for lacking political will to make change happen. And in the unlikely event that reformers are able to introduce and implement new policies in contentious environments, governments are then commended for having the political will to succeed. This is a denial of politics, and it is nonsense. It is like us accepting economists saying that some countries have managed to grow economically because their governments have economic will. <laughs> From my own work in exploring the politics of policy reform, the distribution and use of power creates contentious and sometimes dangerous conditions. Reformers find themselves almost inevitably in the midst of contention. What they do and how they do it is subject to pressures, constraints, moments of opportunities. When they act, they do so in very uncertain environments. So if policy and institutional change occurs or is sustained in any given political context, it's usually the con consequence of political actors who work to build coalitions of support, deal effectively with opposition, manage their resources well, communicate their goals effectively, and push against the boundaries of their route for maneuver. Those who don't wish to see change happen are usually involved in the same kind of activities, but with very different goals in mind. <laughs> the notion of political will denigrates the ongoing and difficult work of politics, and it reduces hard and sometimes dangerous work to the level of mystery and magic. So let's do away with it. Okay. This is the end of my rant. These are just words, but I do think their use influences how we think politically about development. So three billboards. Let's continue to struggle with the issue of structure versus agency figuring out this issue of room for maneuver and making change happen. And where possible, let's try and ex explore it more explicitly. Secondly, let's continue to be aware that exploring political, um, uh, the politics and development involves us in considering the normative consequences of doing politics. And third, let's avoid adopting language that trivializes the role of politics or the meaning of power in telling the story of development. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Grendo. I think the applause <laughs> confirms what you've done. We thank you very much for that. And um, there will be, hopefully, some time for questions and answers. So um, keep your questions and your comments uh, waiting for, for that time. We now turn to Professor Sam Hickey, um, who again, I've come to know only since I um, got involved with the ESSI program, but more, I didn't get in it as an, to make an intellectual contribution, but rather as a manager of a policy research institute that was interested in um, getting some of, getting a part of the research action. But, but in the process, 
we've come to owe Professor Hickey a big debt of gratitude because as he really began uh, as, a, as a result of his tutelage, uh, got in a very fine PhD product out of that, and is in the process of getting a second one. That's a mighty contribution to a relatively small institution over time, so you've left your mark on uh, CDD alone. Just having said that, I also noticed that there are quite a lot of very, very sharp, young Ghanaian academics, intellectuals, who have come out of this institution. Uh, it's great, great congratulations to the University of Manchester for that, but I hope you also understand that if Ghana doesn't uh, make a developmental breakthrough, <laughs> we know, we know who, to, who, 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 who to blame. <laughs> there you go. But <laughs> Professor Hickey is Professor of Politics and Development at the Global Development Institute, which again, understand can sometimes be known as the Ghana Development Institute. <laughs> <laughs> and is his director of research. He has co-edited eight books, half of which are based on Essie's research, and his research focuses on various aspects of the politics of development, with a particular focus on state effectiveness, social protection, natural resource governance, and social justice. So, Professor Hickey, it's your chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jimmy, for that. Uh, and it's been a pleasure uh, to have your, your colleagues with us over the last few years. They've incredibly enlivened the PhD uh, floor within GDI. Things get a little bit tense around elections, uh, but, 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 gen but generally, uh, in Ghana that is, uh, but generally uh, people stick together uh, amongst the, the, the Ghana cohort we have uh, on, the, on the first floor. Um, it's a real privilege to, to share the, the, um, the platform with the... Uh, I, hate to, I don't like calling an elephant merrily, but get since Jima raised. <laughs> since, you know, since Gima raised. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've always wanted to be a giraffe. <laughs> um, oh, but it is a real privilege um, uh, to have been working with you over these last few years, having, as, as Gima has, uh, influenced by your work uh, for much longer than that. Uh, when Pratish and I was... Pratish, can you wave to everyone so everyone knows Pratish is the, uh, the other co-convener of the conference here? Um, uh, when we put together the, the call and, and asked people to, um, to come together, we had no idea we'd have this type of response, um, that we'd be able to have this conversation uh, with so many. It's such a large, vibrant, influential um, community of thinkers and practitioners. Um, uh, so it's, it's a great privilege for us. Uh, and thanks to Merrily for getting the conference off to a great start, foregrounding issues of power as well as politics and showing us where we've come from and where we need uh, to go through. Lots of people, the buzz outside before this session was great. Lots of people refer to this as like being a family reunion. So I thought, that's great. And then I thought, hmm, <laughs> just, just had one of that. I'm not sure my liver can cope with another one. Not, also, some family reunions don't always end particularly well. So I'm trying to think of this as more a sort of an epistemic community of, uh, of, of thinkers and doers around the politics of, of development uh, who are in a critical position to either... Uh, consolidate uh, the, the rise that has, has happened around the pol politics being taken seriously within uh, international development, um, and to consolidate what Tom and Diana call the almost revolution. Most of you were here for the morning sessions where we had doctoral, postdoctoral, early career researchers presenting their work. Uh, we can safely say the next generation is, is, is a powerful one with strong insights, and so I think the consolidation process is likely to... Uh, to go well, as long as we can grapple with the challenges that Meryl has set out in front of us. Uh, what I want to do here in this uh, next uh, few minutes is to start the, the idea, uh, less of paper than to start the conversation that Pratish and I want to have between ECID's work and the wider field of politics and development research uh, that appears on the programme. Um, it's a particularly good time to be doing this, not just because ECID is coming to the, the end of a cycle, we will fade away slowly after the 2020 when the, uh, the money uh, finally uh, runs out. Um, but it's also 10 years, if you like, uh, since one of the landmark texts was published. Uh, Violence and Social Orders appeared in 2009. And in some ways it marked a, um, a, a, a landmark <coughs> moment whereby politics now seem to have got to the mainstream of development theory and development practice, away from institutions matters to politics mattering in a way that also international development agencies seem to be taking seriously. Um, this came 
after at least a decade or so of other governance research that had been undertaken. The Department for International Development funded a range of centres from the early 2000s, a Centre for the Future State uh, at IDS, uh, James Putzel, Centre for Crisis States at LSE, uh, David Booth's work on Africa Power and Politics at ODI. We have the Danish Centre on Elite Poverty and Production, Lindsay Whitfield, Ollie Ferkelson and colleagues. And we have the Australians funding the Development Leadership Programme under the uh, pioneering work of Adrian Lefwich, um, who was one of those people, along with Merrily, beating the drum for politics to be taken seriously in development long before uh, it had been brought in from the margins. And Adrian, uh, before he sadly passed in 2013, uh, was uh, key in establishing the intellectual foundations for ESID. So when we set off in 2011, there were strong foundations. We had no need to reinvent the wheel or kick the door down. Uh, it was something of an open goal, so it, it, as, as bad as not ensuring Ghana's future development trajectory, if we haven't in some small way taken the politics and development agenda forward, uh, then that's, a, that's a, a big failure given where we could start from. So what we wanted to do is to test out some of the new thinking that had been generated and to apply it to a whole series of development puzzles that had been around. There's nothing new about these development puzzles which stretch across the, the realm of inclusive development. But we didn't feel that current thinking around politics and development had done a particularly good job of answering them, perhaps by focusing more on the form that institutions took rather than on the forms of politics and power that shaped how they actually um, functioned in practice. So what we were concerned with was less Merrily's macro level of explaining long-run historical institutional change, which James will bring us to uh, this evening, uh, and nor were we so focused on the coal face of doing development differently. Our work is situated in, in that middle ground. What can be done by governing elites, given their existing state capacities and location within the current global juncture, to deliver development uh, effectively across a range of different policy domains? So we, we aimed at this, this, what merely is in another piece of work called the missing middle within governance research. And methodologically, we identified a series of countries, over 16, uh, in all, uh, that reflected different types of policies or political settlements, where power is more dispersed, we worked a lot in Ghana and Bangladesh, and where power is more concentrated amongst elites, a lot of work in Uganda and Rwanda, as well as others. And we, we undertook a number of studies within these and, and other countries. And we drew heavily on the work of Mushtaq Khan, uh, whose seminal work on political settlements, which he defines in terms of the links between the balance of power and institutions, uh, would shape um, the incentives for elites to invest in, he focused on growth enhancing institutions, we expanded much beyond that. But with the caveat that we also thought that <coughs> ideas would matter, that it wasn't just the politics of survival driving elite behaviour, uh, that ideas at a paradigmatic and policy level would also matter, and we wanted to find out if that was the case. We also hypothesised that political settlements would actually play out very differently in different types of policy domain, which we define as our other main domain of power, a sort of meso-field of power relations which within which actors can test over particular policy issues. Uh, and we felt it is important that these are policy domains which play different types of political roles. This isn't the technocratic world of sectors, but these are um, domains which can help uh, achieve, uh, deliver rents and or legitimacy to ruling coalitions and which have their own sets of ideas and coalitions operating within them in a highly contested way. And where we got to is really just the <coughs> idea that the, the links between the political settlements and these different policy domains is what shapes uh, levels of elites' uh, commitments and state capacity. Is that too close to political will? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just too polite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to the, so we were interested in watching incentives and ideas shape com uh, com uh, commitments and capacity as located within the interaction between those two domains of power. So what we'll do is run through four or five of, our, of these different policy domains, highlight what we found and signal where we're going. So our first phase of research finished in 2017 and we're on track with the next phase of work, which is what you'll be seeing in the conference papers in conversation with all the other great uh, papers that have been entered. So the first, one of our main programmes was on delivering growth and inclusive uh, growth, led by Kunal Sen, who sends his apologies. He's running his own thing now, UNU wider, bigger and better things, uh, and look at their conferences this week. And he led this work with Lamp Pritchett and Eric Worker. 
And one of their main contributions here was to get beyond this idea of growth as one thing, to break it down into uh, different composite components, and to track the politics of takeoff and the politics of sustaining growth. And they found uh, in something that was echoed in Moose's presentation this morning that for countries to take off economically doesn't require adopting a certain set of institutions or rules, but rather <laughs> entering deals between political and economic elites that are sufficiently ordered and credible um, for those deals to stick and be maintained over time. That this is perhaps more likely to un be undertaken by ruling coalitions that are somewhat dominant in power, although some of our cases also identified how elite pacts could emerge around new ideas, around economic growth at certain uh, times. This is the work set out in the Deals and Development book from OUP. <coughs> Moving on to how growth could be sustained was an altogether more difficult uh, challenge. Um, again, growth is highly episodic in developing countries, something that long-run institutional theory can't really help explain to us. Um, and so the deals framework helps alongside political settlements analysis uh, to start showing when countries move beyond boom and bust into sustaining growth. And here we find that more open, inclusive forms of deal making did actually matter, but not in conditions before regulative capacity of governments to regulate firms had already emerged. Uh, and in our phase two work, what uh, Canal and colleagues, including Eric Worker, have tried to do is to identify the cutoff points. At what point is it safe to move towards more open, inclusive institutional deal making uh, and away from the more closed, politically connected world of deal making? Lance's keynote tomorrow um, will, I, th I think, start to show how this framework can be applied to a, a set of ongoing concerns about how countries can become more competitive and again show that where the World Bank and others are looking, where they're doing business surveys, is to look in the wrong place, uh, that what matters is the deals between firms and bureaucrats and political actors and state capabilities around regulation. Um, and it's, it's this, this ability to the interaction between state and business relations that has proved critical in, in most of the work we've done. The ways in which the first phase of growth take off empowers certain forms of capitalists um, who then end up um, holding on to their closed deals for rather too long, reducing dynamism and constraining the growth of other types of capitalists. This is the world of power brokers and rentiers holding back the emergence of manufacturing magicians, uh, for example. In work that Michael Walter will present tomorrow, this type of trap, this type of difficulty of moving beyond growth to structural transformation, often referred to as the middle income trap, is not an institutional trap as much as the literature has, but rather this type of political economy trap. And what Michael will argue for is a clearer understanding of the good and bad types of cronyism and populism that are increasingly characterizing um, so many emerging economies uh, today. And given how difficult it seems to have been for the countries we've looked at to move from growth to structural transformation, and given how closely our frameworks around political settlements are geared towards this promise as being achievable, you start to wonder, particularly given the critique that Danny Roderick and others have made, whether this is still a viable future for, in a particular focus of ours, sub-Saharan Africa. So it'll be interesting to hear what a session, I think tomorrow, David Booth's work, Lindsay Whitfield, Hazel Gray, will talk to us about structural transformation and how industrial policy is playing out and how to understand this um, in a session tomorrow. And Pratish Bihuri's work will identify four very different types of developmental trajectory within sub-Saharan Africa at the moment uh, in a session which will reappraise the potential for developmental states uh, in the 21st century. Um, we've also looked at a different puzzle of the natural resource curse, a pressing issue given uh, how countries could make use of natural resources to uh, avoid the, the resource curse and meet, move towards building uh, more inclusive growth strategies. Um, this is, a, this is obviously a policy domain that's so thick with rents and so integral to the developmental future of countries, it became difficult in our work to distinguish between the political settlement and natural resource fines themselves. And Tony Bevington's work with colleagues in the, in the book shown here does a tremendous job of really eloquently unpacking that relationship in a series of case studies of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in other work that we conducted looking at new oil producers in Sub-Saharan Africa, we found somewhat controversially, and not altogether to the taste, I don't think, of, of, um, of all of our partners, that 
um, semi-authoritarian, if you like, Uganda, seem to be doing a better job um, of making deals with international oil companies than much more democratic and better governed Ghana. Uh, and this is work that drew our attention to the, the influence that long-term political leadership and investment in pockets of effectiveness could have and alerted us to, uh, to looking into that in much more depth in our second phase. Um, but it's also a finding that's uh, started to be challenged by our second phase of research. Um, tomorrow, Eric Worker will present some of our work on how to avoid the resource curse, looking at economic diversification. And we'll suggest it's actually less about state capabilities, more about policy choices that different countries make at certain stages. Our own work, which now looks beyond Ghana and Uganda to look at Mozambique, Kenya, Tanzania as well, is starting to suggest that actually in comparative perspective, Ghana is doing rather better than we first thought, despite continuing to undermine the work of its, of its bureaucrats in the oil uh, technocracy space. And our work in resource uh, curse has certainly emphasised the significant influence of ideas around resource nationalism and where that brings elites, national elites, into contestation with the more neoliberal projects of governmentality promoted by international agencies and international oil companies keen to get the oil out as quickly as possible. And Tabit Jacob, Padil Sadimo, Jose Makune and colleagues will draw attention to that with our work on Tanzania and Mozambique. And Jenny Goldstein from beyond, well beyond ESID, will look at this in relation to Indonesia as well. So plenty to come through on the ideas as well as incentive fronts on the resource curse. Shifting from the economic to the social um, for the next three domains. Um, the work that we did here shifted away from focusing on um, schooling to learning. Um, and within this, Naomi Hussain and the wider ESID team found the focus on coalitions uh, within political settlement analysis to be critical. And our answer to the question of why countries have found it much easier to advance with getting children into school as opposed to ensuring that they actually learn something while they're there is heavily influenced by the different weight of the coalitions in support of each agenda. On the one hand, you have populist presidents supported by large rural constituencies, bankrolled by donor finance and policy advice, underpinning the move towards access, and incredible gains have been made through that. But it's a constituency that by far outweighs the constituency behind learning. Um, I should have included teachers' unions in the first one as well. And the, the constituency behind learning, which might include teachers' associations, um, and sometimes middle classes if they haven't already exited the public sphere, and um, industrialists, some parts of the business community, is just by, who might be arguing for upgrading for the need to be globally competitive, or just by far in the minority, much weaker coalitions in favour of learning. And we find correspondingly fewer incentives for elites to respond to this challenge. There are also different types of policy challenge, and this is why looking at the policy domain really matters as well. Delivering schools, employing more teachers, distributing textbooks, there's rents, there's legitimacy all over that. There's not that's not really there, making teachers do things they don't necessarily want to do. Um, having all those day-to-day -day interactions which shift behaviour around learning is a very different type of transactional policy challenge, as Lance and Matt Andrews and others have argued elsewhere. Different political settlements have different ca capabilities of dealing with these different types of challenges. And here we found the limits of dominance came um, very apparent to us in our work in Uganda, Rwanda uh, and elsewhere, including South Africa. Uh, in at least two ways. Um, but the types of multi-stakeholder coalitions um, <laughs> that, uh, that, you, that you might need at um, the local level to oversee um, district and school level governance um, are much more able to emerge in more open, uh, more competitive contexts. And we found them resolving and solving local institutional problems around learning at district and school level uh, in a way we didn't find in the more top-down approach in certainly Rwanda. There's also a danger of dominance in that it closes down the space to contest bad ideas. Tim Williams' work on Rwanda shows that moving to educational, uh, English as the language of educational instruction overnight isn't the best idea if only 13% of your teaching co um, cohort can actually deliver in that language and the quality in Rwanda uh, slumped accordingly. Um, in Uganda, the, the populist presidency still holds on to the notion of free primary education despite it being anything but and ignores the fact that alternative financing mechanisms are required to drive up quality at local levels. So we, just, we certainly came up with the downsides of dominance around this particular policy challenge. 
when we moved into the politics of recognition, and we looked particularly at gender uh, equality, our aim here, and so this is work led by Sir Hela Nazneen, um, was to go beyond the work on inclusion to influence. The idea that the real role of women included in politics was, to, was solely to drive through gender equity policies and not the responsibility of anyone else. Uh, we wanted to go beyond that. And we swiftly found that both women's inclusion in politics and their ability and the ability of a wider range of actors to promote gender equity was in any case closely conditioned by the nature of the political settlement. That it's the demise and collapse of political settlements into conflict, the rebuilding of them, and the, the types that emerge which define women's entitlements in really important ways. And we trace this through, in particular, the rise not just of women's political inclusion, but of uh, legislation passed against domestic violence. And here we have the salutary finding that democracy is by no means a panacea for gender equity and women's rights in the global south, something that feminist scholarship had already identified with dominant settlements often moving more rapidly and sometimes further uh, with this type of legislation, uh, which took a lot longer to get onto the statute books in the more competitive marketplace uh, of, uh, in, in uh, early, de early de uh, democracies. More importantly, I think, you can't shift from one to the other very easily overnight, or the Awami League is making a damn good go at it in Bangladesh, um, is that we identify different routes towards um, achieving uh, gender equity policies. Um, according to the different types of political settlements. We found that the things that women's activists needed to do differed greatly. Who to build your alliances and coalitions with, whether with the Femocrats or with a political leadership. Um, which ideas that predominated within different political settlements to align your claim making with, and whether or not to deploy informal as well as formal um, institutional strategies to have an influence. And this is work that Sahela Josephine and colleagues will report on uh, in a session tomorrow um, on the role of informal stra strategic working and manoeuvring to achieve gender equity in a session which comes after Anne-Marie Goetz's keynote. Uh, Anne-Marie's work was critical to inspiring our work in the first place, so great to have you back, Anne-Marie. And Anne-Marie's session will focus on uh, the backlash um, to uh, women's, against women's rights and yet again the need to bring the role of the state back into those discussions. Last policy domain that we looked at, or the last one I'll report back on now, um, is around poverty reduction and the, the really rapid spread of social protection and particularly social cash transfers in sub-Saharan Africa um, over the 2000s. That, uh, in a book which is coming out in November, um, led by Tom Lavers and myself at ESID, and by colleagues from UCT and UNU Rider. Uh, and what our findings tended to do was to challenge the idea that this was either an entirely donor-driven process or a global revolution from the South, from Latin America, uh, moving out of Mexico and Brazil, or that it was necessarily about elections and democratization in sub-Saharan Africa. Rather, we found that in different types of political settlements, the ideas of the transnational policy coalitions that have been promoting cash transfers aligned with different ideas and incentives in very different ways in different types of political settlement. So in our more competitive context, Ghana, Kenya, um, eventually Tanzania to some extent, and, and Zambia, uh, we found that international pressure was critical to adoption, but then social protection only becomes institutionalized through elections and a politics of survival kicks in, and this is seen as being a useful way of reaching out to voters in a particular way that fits in with patron-client politics uh, as much as it does uh, anything to do with a new social contract. Well, we found this to have no influence at all in countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, Mozambique, where elections aren't competitive. And here, cash transfers were only taken on in conditions where elites perceived there to be a distributional crisis that threatened their hold on power or threatened even the political settlement itself, as revealed in Ethiopia uh, in particular. And it was only then that social protection starts to become institutionalized. In the new phase of work, which Tom Lavers and colleagues will be presenting, uh, in the conference later on, uh, we're looking away from adoption towards the implementation of, of social protection and showing how local configurations of power interact with long-run historical factors to shape how effectively and how impartially um, social protection gets delivered at the local level. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of uh, um, a whiz through, um, and apologies for the ECID teams in the room whose uh, work I've just done great disservice to. Um, you can, most of the work's open access, so do dig into it in more depth. 
What we basically identify is two, two very different trajectories for development, at least two, and this, this is hur a heuristic. Um, there's not one better than the other. We can't answer Merrill's question of which is good and which is bad. Um, they often led to similar types of outcomes, drawing attention to the importance of how politics shapes things differently in a way that is actually associated with equi equifinality rather than one being better than the other. The one is obviously the one we've talked about, the dominant route through ruling coalitions that are cohesive, driven by strong uh, paradigmatic ideas around development that bind elites together around nation-building projects and enforced by fairly strong, capable, centralised states. Not a route that's immediately available to most uh, of countries in the, in the global south. We also identified a different route through in conditions which are more competitive. And here we found a critical role for those coalitions <laughs> able to offset problems of fragmented elites and politicised bureaucracies and put in place institutional fixes. Ideas also mattered here, particularly when elites were faced with threats um, that... Uh, transcended partisan divides and enabled elites to come together around fixing problems and there's more space here for policy ideas to be brought in uh, by external actors as well. So to summarise what we found out is that context really matters not just in the sense that everywhere is different but in very specific ways in relation to different types of political settlement that can be understood. And the other two C's are capacity and coalitions and I'll say a bit more about each of those before closing. The first of which is to, to make the statement that I guess an effective states and inclusive development centre was maybe always going to find this, um, that state capacity is really important. Um, we wouldn't have been doing the job on the tin really, would we, if we uh, had missed that one. But we did find that uh, it's the, still the only form of public authority capable of managing globalisation, protecting uh, its citizens, um, imposing order, um, and delivering services and protecting rights of minority groups, uh, challenging um, forms of patriarchy and exclusion uh, that we find. Um, and it needs to be, there needs to be a rebalancing, we think, of current debates around what types of politics really matter for shaping developments in this direction. Whereby Anthony Savoya and colleagues has pointed out that if we want to be serious about attaining global development goals, then state capacity really does matter. Now, this brings us into tension with other normative ideas around uh, which, for which types of institutions really matter. Is it all about being effective? What about being inclusive and accountability? Is it a case of sequencing? You need one, then the other. Can all good things come together? Uh, our work with the limited number of case studies and policy domains we've looked at tends to, uh, tends to shift the emphasis towards one of sequencing. Um, this builds on wider lessons about the failures of ele big elements of the Washington Consensus and the Good Governance Agenda, which has pointed out that pushing for high degrees of uh, in inclusion and certain rather, rather certain institutional forms designed apparently to drive up inclusion um, can have very poor co uh, consequences and results uh, in situations before, uh, before strong institutions have been built. This is one of the key highlights of Merrill's excellent 2012 book, on patronage and pointing out how the politics of patronage is very difficult to get away from if you, you're asking states to manage highly competitive processes um, before strong public institutions have been built. And our work on pockets of effectiveness um, seems to highlight that. And this is a really difficult message at the current juncture. It's been a difficult debate within ESID um, on a normative basis. At the current juncture, when you see democratic backsliding and popular... Um, authoritarianism at, in, at every level of the economic order from OECD through all four BRIC countries into the next 11, um, Turkey, Bangladesh, East Africa, wh wherever you look, apart from a few highlights, it's, this isn't the time at which to be, it would seem from a liberal perspective to be saying anything other than uh, let's double down on the promise of liberalism. But I think what the ESID message, and this is my interpretation, the, the wider network will have their, their own views on this, is that the type of response to this Neither, neither of the main two responses have been adequate. On the one hand, we have had this doubling down on the promise of liberalism. And you find this in various meetings of governance advisors within the OECD, for example. The big emphasis on the inclusive aspects of, of institutions within SDG 16 and ignoring the effects of institutions. Um, 
Uh, and on the other hand, you, you have a different camp emerging or re-emerging within international development, which is actually maybe a more conservative response and this idea that goes back to Samuel Huntingdon that actually a bit of order and if it, um, an authoritarianism might be quite good to put messy contemptuous <laughs> politics back into its box might be what we were always wanting to subjugate political imperatives and goals to socio-economic ones. And we don't think either is a viable position to be in. The evidence doesn't stack up very nicely behind either camp. Ethically, there's problems with it. But we also think it's looking at things in the wrong, from the wrong perspective. Um, and we suggest three moves past that. The first is that we need to get beyond this language of democracy or dictatorships, and we think that the language of political settlements can start to do that by focusing on underlying configurations of power, not regime types um, or particular uh, regime forms. And that we, we show, hope that our findings and the findings of others have shown that that can give us a clearer understanding of the different routes towards development. Um, we think the other route is to go back to um, political history and socioeconomic history in the global north and, ident and realize that actually building state capacity was a critical element of that. We didn't start with liberal democratic forms, uh, despite what the good governance agenda told us in terms of promoting those elsewhere. Um, Richard Sandbrook's work at, at, at al., uh, which traces the roots of social democracy in the global north as well as the global south, is very clear that state formation preceded the forms of inclusive programmatic politics enable states to hold the ring once those emerged. So I guess the challenge is really uh, to start reclaiming ideas about state capacity for a more progressive agenda um, that, than has hitherto been the case. Um, I think one of the things James may argue later is that this is a false divide anyway. We can have all these good things together. Uh, our mid-range theorising hasn't told us that yet. The longer range theorising might... Oh, there we go, we're back. Um, uh, we'll see where we get to later. But some of what will be presented in the conference begins to identify policy agendas that m can maybe offer both of these things. We have new work from uh, Marianne Ulrichson and Anne-Lesa Kier, for example, on how revenue bargaining can maybe drive up state capacity as well as more accountable forms of <laughs> politics. The final C is coalitions. Uh, a new buzzword, I guess, uh, in international development, well beyond ECID. Others have identified this. I guess our contribution is to try and situate coalitions as being really critical mechanisms for mediating between the underlying configurations of power, institutions, and policy reform. That this is the key form of agency uh, to respond to Merrill's question that we found able to navigate very difficult governance contexts, offering order and legitimacy when, when sufficiently inclusive, enabling state capacity to emerge. And here I think we are on the same page. Of, Pinched a quote from James and Dionysi Moglu's uh, book that we've presented later, which I think shows that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're talking the same language here around coalitions. But this is also an actionable arena of policy engagement. We found them to be very important within given policy domains, progressing new agendas, delivering goods in local contexts. Where does this take us theoretically and strategically? And then I'll sit down. Uh, you've been very generous, uh, Professor Jima. Um, theoretically, um, in terms of where we're taking things, the, session, the next session in here after this one uh, will show two routes forward that Easter has tried to push in this second phase of work. The first by Tim Kelsall and Nikolai Schultz has tried to suggest or will argue that political settlements, when re-theorised, moving on from Mushtaq Khan's theory, can be theorised in a more rigorous way, can be measured and can be correlated with development outcomes, we hope. Uh, in a project that's very much in its early stages and on, on route. In a, in a second paper in the next session, a slightly different route is identified. Matthias von Hau will present work which shows that political settlements analysis is best thought of as being a kind of mid-range theory for explaining capacity and commitments within approximate generational time frame. Not the long-run histories, not the day-to-day, -day, um, but more the, uh, a more generational level. Uh, and we put this into conversation and use it as a sort of filling the missing middle that Merrill's work has identified. The strategic implications will be thought through throughout the conference. We argue for a rebalancing, not getting rid of inclusion and accountability, but a rebalancing for taking capacity seriously. We think we've identified a particular form that that can be usually cohered around with pockets of effectiveness, but our work in that project uh, has identified that actually international agencies have long been building um, part, certain parts of the state in sub-Saharan Africa to be relatively effective, 
But these are the parts of the state that really enabled a particular form of neoliberal governmentality and the neoliberal global order to emerge and function effectively. These are central banks, finance ministries, and so on. They're not the parts of the state that are required for industrial transformation or structural transformation, and there needs to be a rebalancing um, of that project of state building. Um, in terms of uh, building on context, we think there's room, much more room for development practice to be attuned with particular political settlement types and dynamics and have begun to show how that can be done. We have done some work around the thinking and working politically agenda that many colleagues in the room have worked on. Not nowhere near as much as, say, the DLP programme there. So we've been very lucky to have lots of papers from uh, David Hudson and colleagues. Uh, and there's a great plenary at lunchtime tomorrow in this room that I'd urge you to rush to after your... Uh, sandwiches and come to at one o'clock tomorrow where the, the TWP agenda will be mapped out. What do we know about the evidence and we'll have some practitioner perspectives on that. Our own work tends to suggest that there's, there's quite a few. It's a double-edged sword, this notion of going with the grain and understanding how uh, g going with the grain of political settlements can actually undermine some transformative agendas.